Our society is still in its early milestones and it is growing slowly, requiring a lot of support for growth from the fully developed associations and societies like Yamagi. Uh, its current member, members total is about 60 plus, including healthcare professionals like doctors, nurses, and the other supporting staff. Looking at the numbers of doctors alone, we have about over 14 gastro health surgeons and just about 17 qualified uh, medical gastroenterologists. So the training in our university for this level started around uh, 2012 and now the numbers are steadily increasing and we hope care will be improved further. If you, are, if you look at the endoscopy services in our country, they have been steadily increasing in volume and quality as well in both diagnostic and uh, therapeutic procedures. And we estimate around 10,000 endoscopies, both therapeutic and diagnostic, being performed here countrywide. Currently, the endoscopy services are available in a few tertiary uh, government hospitals like Muimiri National Hospital, Uganda, KCMC, and Benjamin Kappa. But these endoscopy services are also available in private uh, hospitals, uh, to mention a few, uh, Aga Khan Hospital, Rabinicia, and the other hospitals. But the distribution countrywide is not even. Many areas, especially uh, the remote areas, do not have such services. Yeah. So today, we are talking about the role of endoscopy in diagnosis and treatment of GI disorders is our theme for this conference. But we still bear in mind that we lack equipment, enough equipment, and adequate numbers of qualified trained endoscopists who can actually deliver cold care to our patients. So currently, as a society, we have a very serious task to make sure that we increase access of endoscopy to our Tanzanian population by formulating the short and long term strategies. The society intends to foster collaboration among its members as well as cooperation with other local and international societies that will help in achieving the mission of the society. We have started slowly to increase the number of gastroenterologists and the pathologists. The Mwimbi University of Health and the Life Sciences has established a training program uh, at the MSC level, both for surgical and medical gastroenterologists since 2012. However, at the moment, though the training is going on, but we still have challenges in terms of equipment. We are at least doing well with the diagnostic procedures, but we are lagging behind when it comes to therapeutic endoscopy, uh, ERCP, and uh, endoscopic ultrasound. We have been blessed to procure the first ever endoscopic ultrasound in our national hospital. Thank you to the executive director and the whole team of Mwimbili National Hospital, and of course, the arrival of Amage delegates, we managed to perform the first ever endoscopic ultrasound in your country. So, we are very delighted to receive the delegates uh, from Amage, led by His Excellency President Reda, to come and see for themselves what is going on in our country as far as endoscopic services are concerned. For the few days, these delegates from Amagi have stayed in our country. They have given us a lot in terms of training in endoscopy as well as uh, endoscopic ultrasound, of course. Uh, I consider the visit by the Amagi delegates as an exploratory visit looking for guests that uh, 
you as AMAGE members can help us to cover in the future. We believe as you go back to your home, you will assist us in various aspects of endoscopy care, especially training us, giving us more training in therapeutic and advanced endoscopy. I know we have been slow to join membership to other uh, professional societies in gastroenterology and hepatology inside and outside Africa, but targets now we have decided to take this issue seriously and soon after this conference we will send applications to join AMAGE and uh, WGO so that we can improve our collaboration with the other societies. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank everyone so much for participating in this uh, conference. I would like particularly to thank Mwibini National Hospital through the executive director for promoting our society, for giving help, us help in preparation of this event. They have actually provided the Zoom link so we can discuss our presentation through the Zoom. Accreditation for the CPD and of course they have been continuously supporting us as a society. Asante Sana Kwahilo. Also, I would thank so much the Arab Fund for, for technical assistance to African countries, the, that is the AFTA, for sponsoring AMAGA delegates to our conference and of course for the hand-on training which was done this week at Mumbili. I also thank so much the pharmaceutical companies that have given us a hand in this uh, conference, including the Mega We Care, Upper Care Health Tanzania, Mora Pharmaceuticals, Sun Farm through the Abacus. You have been really good friends for us. Even with short notice, you have given us a helping hand. Your products that you promote are really crucial in the management of our patients. And of course, this will help us to reach our mission. Um, before I finish up my talk, uh, I would really want to welcome His Excellency, the President of Amage, just to give us a few words and introduce his delegates before we invite our guest of honor, Karim. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hedwiga Eswai, uh, the medical director of uh, Mohimbini National Hospital, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Muziri, the executive director of uh, Mohimbini National Hospital, uh, dear Dr. Komba, the president of Tagus, uh, uh, dear uh, uh, our uh, friends uh, from, from uh, the members of uh, TAGIS and dear my colleagues from uh, AMAJ, AMAJ delegates. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is the first and uh, second very, uh, visit to AMAJ to uh, your beautiful country. We came here in 2019 and we enjoyed a lot in the, our first and second visit and I hope to be repeated. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, my colleagues from AMAJ. We have with us Professor Medhat Sahar. He is a treasurer of AMAJ. He is a, a police general. Uh, he is the director of all police hospitals in Egypt. Professor Medhat Sahar is an eminent <laughs> gastroenterologist and hepatologist in Egypt too. We have with us Professor Eddie Makhoul uh, uh, from Lebanon. Uh, he is uh, the director of uh, gastroenterology and uh, endoscopy in Catholic University in Lebanon and is the president of Jumea, 
is an important uh, society for training on animals. And German Middle East Association for Training on Animal Models, Professor Elia. He is, he is the chair of training committee in Amash. We have Professor Mohammed Kamal Shakir, Professor of Tropical Medicine, Hepatology, Gastroenterology in Ain Shams University, uh, uh, past president of the Department of Tropical Medicine, and he is the chair of uh, 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 HCC in our uh, uh, association in Amaj. Uh, uh, he is uh, a member of Amaj, Professor Mohammed Kamal, please. We have Professor Samah Abdul Wahab. Uh, he is a professor of interventional radiology, the current director of interventional uh, radiology department in Ain Shams University in Cairo. He is also a member of the board of Amash, Professor Samah. And lastly, in our uh, delegates, uh, Mrs. Shireen Imam, Ambassador Shireen Imam. Uh, she is uh, uh, from representing the Arab Fund for Technical Assistance uh, in two African countries, one of the organs of the League of Arab States. Uh, uh, thanks to her generous help, who uh, sponsored our tickets and accommodation through our visits to uh, uh, Tanzania and Zanzibar. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Shireen. Could you please, could you please stand up? Uh, we uh, came here to uh, Zanzibar and uh, uh, Tanzania to uh, exploratory visit, as uh, Professor Kumba said, uh, because our, uh, our mission in, uh, in Amaj is to help as much as we can, uh, in spite of very tight uh, uh, resources and funds, but we, we struggle to have funds and resources to do our mission. We, uh, we f I feel that our main mission is to uh, change experiences with our friends and colleagues from Africa, because AMAJ stands for uh, uh, African Middle East Association for Gastroenterology. It's a regional, uh, regional association uh, affiliated to the World Gastroenterology Organizations. AMAJ is, is representing 29 uh, so national societies in Africa and the Middle East. So we have to extend our connections with all countries in, in Africa, in the Africa continent. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry for this short visit for a few days in Tanzania and a few days in Zanzibar, because, uh, 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 as I said, it was an exploratory visit. So I hope that in the next time, we can stay for a longer period and we can get some more uh, accessories. I'm sorry that I couldn't bring with me more than 100 band delegation pieces uh, that complementary to Mohimbini National Hospital. Next time I hope to find the, the, the funds to bring more and more uh, accessories uh, to be helpful. Uh, I'm looking forward to that the Tagis will be an active member of Amash, and you come with us in the, uh, uh, um, the, the board of the organization because this is a pathway to get an access to the WGO yes. and to have a positions in the World Gastroenterology Organization. Currently, I am a member of the governing council of the WGO. I'm the only African person in the governing uh, council of the World Gastroenterology Organization. I'm looking forward, next time will, will be a Tanzanian person in my place uh, after he is uh, the president of Amash. I'd like to thank you again for your uh, welcoming, very welcoming attitude uh, to make our uh, stay here uh, easy and uh, enjoyable. Thank you again, thank you very much. I'm very happy to hear from his own lips that uh, they are willing to support us more. And of course, the future visits, they'll be a little bit longer than now. 
And uh, of course, he has also spoken about assistance in terms of uh, equipment and uh, other things that will help us in endoscopy. I should really thank you so much and all the delegates for coming and of course for participation. Of the conference. Thank you so much. Without wasting time, I would now really take this opportunity to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Eduga Swai, the Director of Medical Services at Muidiri National Hospital, representing the executive director. Tanzania Gastroenterology and Endoscopic Society, Dr. Ewaldo Komba, President of the African Middle East Association of Gastroenterology, Professor Mohamed Reda Elwaki, doctors and professionals from Tanzania, Egypt, Lebanon, and Ethiopia, endoscopist doctors and the nurses who are members of this society, invited speakers and other guests. Mr. President, it is my sincere appreciation to the organizing committee for inviting me to be the guest of HANA in this important event, being hosted by the Tanzania Gastroenterology and Endoscopic Society. It is a great opportunity for me to meet with gastroenterology and the hepatology professionals from all areas within the country and also from other countries. The conference theme, that is endoscopic role in diagnosis. Thank you so much. The pharmaceutical companies that have given us a hand in this uh, conference, including the Mega We Care, Upper Care Health Tanzania, Mora Pharmaceuticals, Sun Farm, through the Abacas. We serve to work together with the government in ensuring gastrointestinal tract health in Tanzania is taken into another step. Tanzania Transition into middle income country require a pool of higher skilled labor force. It's therefore important that training of different gastrointestinal cadre be streamlined towards obtaining this objective. Availability of quality products and equipment in provision of gastrointestinal health require a critical assessment by joint forces of all stakeholders. From the speech of Mr. President, I noted that we have lack of equipment and also we have lack of expertise in endoscope and ERCP. And I'm sure the collaboration with our mother will bring us into another step and I'm sure Training on endoscope have already been conducted. And another thing which brings lack of equipment is uh, endoscopies are very, very expensive. And the preventive maintenance is also very expensive. And also within the country, we don't have, uh, I can say, a uh, biomedical engineer or technician to fix the machine. And another issue, we have a lot of students who are using the same machine. They don't know how to control, so they cause a lot of breaking of this machine. We have a plan of having laboratory. Uh, is it called a laboratory or what? Where we can use dummy. Uh, 
What is it? But I think you understand what I want to say. What? Simulator. Yes, a simulator. So that our student can use dummy instead of going straight to use human being and destroy our scope. This is the problem. And the so much the pharmaceutical companies that have given us a hand in this uh, conference, including the Mega We Care, Upper Care Health Tanzania, Mora Pharmaceuticals, Sun Farm, through the Abacus. You have been really good friends for us. Even and we still have patients. It is a disaster. We have already paid, but if you communicate to them, they don't respond and the machine are not coming. So this is a big challenge for us too. Uh, the collaboration that uh, your association has with other partners like the Center for Training in Cairo is surely a commendable and shows your commitment in keeping abreast with international standards and requirements. The hospital acknowledge your effort, especially during the year, year commemoration of World Hepatitis Day on in 28 July. Mr. President, the effort made by Target in partnership with stakeholder in gastroenterology, health, education. in the gastrointestinal health that will enable you to render clinical service to communities in need. I also acknowledge and appreciate activities done by delegates of AMAG who decided to come and dedicate your time to train other African countries and Tanzania is one of the chosen countries. I'm informed that you train our staff on endoscopic ultrasound, colonoscopy technique, band ligate and pediatric. And uh, however, I'm also thankful for the support of a hundred band ligator to Mohimbiri National Hospital. Give, me, give them a hand of clap. <laughs> it's my wish that such kind of collaboration has to continue in order to help doctors in the rest of Africa. Mr. President, support rendered to your association by the various stakeholders and the exhibitor show that you have an integrated leadership with enough courage. Emonet would like to acknowledge your partners, Mega We Care and Morris. I take this opportunity to welcome the facilitators presenters and participants of this conference that will be held today, the 23rd to 24th September 2022, and we wish you all the best. With these few remarks, I take this opportunity to thank you for your participation and to inviting me to officiate this meeting. I hereby officially declare this meeting open. Thank you for listening. Just to give us a few words and introduce the delegates before we invite our guest of honor. The director of medical services for your kind words and very encouraging words of appreciation both to targets and to the delegates and all the supporters who have made this event really a dream come true. So without wasting much time, I will return the mic to the MC. Thank you.
Thank you so much, the president of Tages, the president of Amage, and the, our guest of honor, the director of medical services from the Muhimbili National Hospital. May we all, in humility, give a round of applause to our giant in the room. Thank you so much. Uh, I would love to, before going for, our, for the break, I would love to welcome us all to the front so that we may take a memorable photo with our guest of honor and the, our president, uh, because our guest of honor will be having other, other commitment and she will be leaving this place. So may I humbly welcome you all to march forward and align so that we may take the group photo. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Professor of Interventional Radiology. Uh, we started this hepatoma group in March 2002. So we have uh, around 20 years experience in dealing with cases of HCC. Uh, ولا ثاني ولا ولا ثالث ولا اهي خلاص اتس اوكي يو هاف ا اوكي اوكي ذس ويل بي فاين نو اي نيد تو 
in the plantation. Yeah, it goes. Yeah, it goes. Yeah. And the, the, and the two genes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the first lesson from uh, this group is dealing with HCC is a multidisciplinary team. It's not a one-man show. It should contain all who are dealing with basal carcinoma, pathologist, interventional radiologist, clinical oncologist, hepatic surgeons are the main uh, cornerstones of this group. As I said, we started in 2002. Uh, at the beginning, the first year, we saw cumulative 122 cases. In 2017, we've seen 1,380 cases per year. As regards new cases, in 2002, we started with 19 cases all over the year. In 2017, we had 414 cases uh, each year. Uh, the following slides are some demonstration of what we did during the past years. Uh, this work is of a liver transplantation of a total number of 146 patients. In Egypt, we do liver donor transplantation. Uh, the survival probability in those patients, the overall survival of the first year was 95%, three years overall survival, 88%, and five years survival was 85%. The disease-free survival was 94, 81.6 and 81.5, one year, three years, and five years, respectively. Recurrence rate, we had 19 cases of recurrence uh, during a median observation period of 31.6 months. 12 of the current cases were within MLAN criteria and 7 were beyond MLAN criteria. The median survival time in recurrent HCC patients post living donor liver transplantation is uh, 23 months. The pattern of the recurrence, 18 of the 19 were extrahepatic recurrence and eight were recurrent HCC within the graft. This is what I said in the previous slide, 65% uh, within Milan and 35% uh, were beyond Milan. And the recurrence, as I said, 12 of the 19 were within the Milan criteria and seven were outside. This curve shows that the, pre, the starting alpha fetoprotein has a, a pattern with the recurrence. This, it shows significant uh, high recurrence rate among patients with high serum alpha fetoprotein above 400 before the liver donation or the liver transplantation. The tumor grade also has an uh, impact on the recurrence where the tumor grade more than one shows a significant predictor of higher recurrence. Also in the graft, if there is microvascular invasion or no, the microvascular invasion was a significant predictor of higher recurrence rate. Uh, this shows that our patients uh, were PCLCA, child class A or B, the overall survival in the child class A 24 months and class B 25 months. Uh, this work 
is a comparison between the two methods we have of the local regional treatment, the radiofrequency ablation and the microwave ablation. Uh, there is no significant difference between both as regards the overall uh, survival. Study regarding transarterial chemoembolization versus transarterial chemoembolization plus ablation. Because we started to do ablation with transarterial chemoembolization in the uh, rather larger tumors. The one year disease free survival and overall survival were longer after the combined therapy. One year recurrence rate and local tumor progression were higher after case alone. In larger tumors, the combined treatment, RFA and TACE, showed trends of superior local disease control when compared to the TACE alone. Doing combined therapy, we can do ablation first, followed by TACE, or we can do TACE first, followed by ablation. The median time to recurrence was 30 months after radiofrequency followed by TACE compared to 19.6 months if we do TACE followed by radiofrequency. The median disease-free survival was 23 months in radiofrequency followed by TACE and it was 17.1 months in TACE followed by radiofrequency. One year uh, tumor uh, time to local recurrence was 5% and 16% after RFA or TACE respectively, and the two year was 19 versus uh, 49. Uh, if the patient is BLCB, then the Overall survival in the child A was 19.3 and in the child B was 17 and a half month, the overall survival. <clears throat> the median survival for hepatocellular carcinoma after taste treatment was 16.2 months. Uh, we studied the difference between the conventional taste and the uh, uh, drug eluting beads. The three year survival was 14% in the conventional TS and 33% in the uh, drug eluting beads. Radiologic, radiological response there is no statistical significant difference between the drug eluting beads versus the conventional TS when comparing radiological response about, among both groups. But uh, some patients does not uh, prefer to the, the conversion test because it gives uh, more com complications and more pain after uh, the procedure. Uh, this study was performed between Shams University and Essen University comparing the transarterial chemoembolization and the tear, the tra transarterial radioembolization. In the TACE, the median survival time was 18 months, and in the tear, median survival was 16.4 months. <coughs> time to progression in the TACE group was 6.8, while time to progression in the tear group was 13.3 months. In intermediate HCC patients, both treatments resulted in several survival probabilities, despite more advanced disease in the tear group, because in the tear group, most of the patients have portal vein thrombosis. Still, the tear was better tolerated and associated with less hospitalization and treatment sessions, putting into consideration that the tear is much, much more ex expensive than the taste. 
Uh, if the patient is BCLCC, child A, the overall survival is 9.3 months, and the child class B is one month. Uh, the median uh, survival in the group uh, of these patients of the radio embolization, child A was 17.2 months and the child B was 6 months. Survival probability in the portal vein thrombosis group was 10 months. Median survival was significantly, uh, this is study uh, comparing sorafenib versus the capitazibin, the sorafenib is the Nexavar and the capitazibin is the Zeluda. The median survival was significantly longer in sorafenib group compared to capitazibin, seven months versus five months. Patient-free survival was significantly longer in uh, sorafenib group than in the capitazibin. This was a clinical trial, a multi-center uh, trial in Egypt done in five centers. Our uh, group shared in this, comparing sorafenib versus uh, sorafenib plus UFT, the Tigafirol or Acil. This was a study in, uh, on the clinicaltrial.gov. Uh, it was a phase two study, but at uh, as first-line systemic treatment for patients with advanced HCC are acceptable and not, not legible for local ablation. Uh, but we, uh, the study was terminated uh, after doing mm -hmm. interim analysis because we found uh, it was not significant. Thank you very much. Mr. President, I have time to for the second lecture or? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. second lecture. Yes, this one, please. Is now prevented? Is it preventable yeah. or not? This issue, anybody can do it. But the first issue, no, <laughs> the, 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 every center can do it. So this is more important. <laughs> so not to reach the, uh, the first point. Okay. So okay, no, no. Well, in this uh, 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 lecture, I'm going to uh, present a question. Is hepatocellular carcinoma Preventable or not? And if we can do what's presented here, maybe we can decrease the rates of uh, a pet cell carcinoma. نستخدم الريموت لازم يطلع عندي
Basal carcinoma, 90% of it is a primary liver cancer, and it's 4.7% of all cancers. The male to female ratio is 2.8, and from the numbers we have, it's a deadly tumor, because new cases in 2018 were uh, 841,000 cases, and the death rate was 7. 181,000.6, so it's a deadly tumor, especially if we don't uh, discover the tumor in early uh, phases. Uh, this is the incidence rates all over the world, and it is estimated that 82% of liver cancer occurred in developing countries. China alone has 55% of the total HCC worldwide. The highest rates are found in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where the rates of hepatitis B virus ranges between 10 to 25%. Uh, Why do we need prevention of HCC? HCC is highly refractory to therapeutic intervention. Even after resection or ablation, 70% of the patients experience tumor recurrence within five years. Once tumor progresses to an advanced stage, currently available medical therapies yield only marginal, marginal survival benefit and are not cost effective. The highly complex and heterogeneous genetic aberrations in HCC tumors hamper the identification of therapeutic strategies despite the emerging breadth of molecular targeted anti-cancer agents. So therefore, it seems sensible to consider preventing HCC development and progression. Uh, what's primary prevention? This is designed to deter or avoid the occurrence of disease or injury. The secondary prevention is designed to identify and adequately treat a disease or injury process as soon as possible, often before any symptoms have developed, while the tertiary prevention is designed to treat a disorder when it has advanced beyond its early stages to avoid complications and limit disability to address rehabilitative and palliative needs. Uh, the primary prevention focuses on preventing exposure to cancer predisposing factors or eliminating that, them at an early stage. It includes vaccination, lifestyle modification, and in, environmental interventions. Uh, the secondary prevention covers early detection and prevention of HCC occurrence in patients already exposed to the etiological agents this includes the screening and surveillance program and the chemo prevention. The tertiary prevention after radical treatment of HSC aims to reduce recurrence by screening and chemo prevention. This cartoon shows the uh, progression of uh, liver from normal liver to fibrosis to cirrhosis and to up to the uh, occurrence of HCC. Regarding the primary prevention, includes hepatitis B vaccination and immunoglobulins, screening of all pregnant women for hepatitis B virus, good screening of blood banks and blood products, strict application of infection control measures among healthcare providers and in healthcare facilities, avoid sharing needles, syringes, razors, toothbrushes, awareness about uh, safe sex. Uh, this is the impact of the vaccination on HCC uh, incidence and mortality in Taiwanese uh, children. Uh, Taiwan, uh, I think uh, the inventor of this vaccine, he has received the Nobel Prize, Medhat, he received Nobel Prize for, for this because he, he did a, a lot of work in Taiwan as regarding the uh, 
prevention and the reduction of the mortality rate, and it's seen from this graph that the incidence uh, decreased and the mortality also decreased after the implication of the uh, vaccination for the uh, children, uh, the newly born. Primary prevention also uh, includes uh, that the susceptible food stuffs should be screened, especially for the aflatoxin, and do not enter the market if unacceptably high levels are present. Spraying with fungicides and adequate irrigation, sun drying of crops before storage and drying on cloth rather than directly on earth, well ventilated and rainproof. Uh, storage facilities. Uh, avoid smoking, alcohol drinking, increase the physical activity, avoid weight gain, but I don't know how, and healthy food. I can't avoid weight gaining. As regarding the secondary prevention, screening is a vital component of the cancer uh, prevention. And uh, in, in Egypt now, we started a program of screening and early detection of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, hope uh, that we'll, we'll gain from this. So as if you detect the HCC in an uh, early uh, condition, you can deal with it in a curative uh, treatment rather than palliative treatment if you de detect it later. Uh, current practice guidelines recommend regular HCC screening by biannual ultrasound with or without alpha fetoprotein, but I think that most of the guidelines now, except the easel guidelines, the SLD, the Apazel, the Chinese, the Egyptian, we, we do ultrasound plus uh, alpha fetoprotein in clinically identifiable population at risk for HCC. And the HCC screening is cost effective and uh, associated with improved early tumor detection, curative treatment rates, and survival when it is available to more than. 34% of the patients at risk. Uh, however, the real-world utilization rate is below 20% for multiple patient and provider-related reasons. Late diagnosis, the five-year survival is less than 5 to 10%, while in early diagnosis, the five-year survival rises to 40 to 70%. I should identify my target population. Uh, this was study uh, performed by our late professor Zayadi in Egypt, and they found that the surveillance increased the early detection of HCC and it doubled the chances for curative cure. This is the largest multi uh, randomized controlled trial. It was uh, performed in 2004 by Zhang in China. Uh, he performed a screening on 18,816 hepatitis B positive patients. He performed surveillance by ultrasound plus alpha fetoprotein uh, every six months. Adherence to uh, the surveillance program was suboptimal, less than 60%. And he ended stating that SCC mortality was reduced by 37% in the mortality in the surveillance arm, and he also found that early detection of HCC in stage one was 60% in the screened group, while in the control group, uh, stage one was not present at all, and uh, stage two was uh, detected in 37%, and stage three in 63%. Early diagnosis and treatment of the liver disease, uh, the inherited 
is, uh, as Wilson and hemochromatosis are of paramount importance, recent studies and guidelines suggest that early treatment of acute FCV infection prevents its progression to chronic C. Antiviral treatment for viral hepatitis appears to have benefits in decreasing the risk of HCC in chronically infected patients. This benefit is most pronounced in patients with chronic hepatitis C achieving viral clearance, while it seems much more marginal in patients with uh, hepatitis B, where the antiviral therapy usually results in viral suppression rather than its elimination. Uh, this shows that HCV eradication used by directly acting antiviral uh, drugs reduce the risk of HCC in cirrhotic and in non-cirrhotic patients. In patients with decompensated cirrhosis without hepatocellular carcinoma, the directly acting antiviral treatment uh, to prevent or uh, reinfection after transplantation is cost effective. Long-term treatment of intikaver in hepatitis B uh, infection, uh, this uh, reduced the incidence of uh, the uh, development of HCC. Uh, the first line is the intikaver, the second line is the lamivudine, and the third one is the control group. Prevention of developed in patients older than uh, 50 years at the time of onset of the nucleoside analog treatment. This shows the effect of obesity and the metabolic syndrome. It affects uh, many types of cancer, basal uh, body mass index and mortality. This is from the cancer among U.S. men. Liver cancer had the highest relative risk. Lifestyle intervention may serve as secondary prevention as suggested by observational studies. A meta-analysis of 19 studies involving 1,290,000 patients reported that increased intake of vegetables but not fruits may reduce HCC risk. In a prospective cohort of uh, 428,000 428, subjects, Higher physical activity was associated with lower HCC risk. <coughs> As regarding the tertiary prevention, all patients who underwent ablation or resection of HCC should be screened for recurrence. Screening by dynamic CT or MRI every three months for the first two years, then every six months. HCC incidence and recurrence rates after the directly acting uh, induced SVR in previously treated HCV related HCC. Uh, they were saying in, the, in, in this uh, conference in the easel there were a debate uh, as regards the HCC recurrence after the uh, directly acting antiviral treatment, but uh, further maybe in 2020, two or three large studies solved this problem, and they said one from Paris and one from uh, USA on the veterans, and they declared that DAS has no uh, uh, impact on the recurrence of uh, the uh, HCC, because in 2016, two studies, one from Italy and one from uh, Barcelona, they uh, said that directly acting antiviral treatment can cause recurrence, but this was uh, not uh, true after the two studies. Treatment.
test for the biological activity of the tumor. If there is no early recurrence, you can treat further the patient for FCC to ensure that there is no aggressive uh, FCC behavior to avoid, avoid development of aggressive tumor. Presence of active HCC tumor at the initiation of HCC therapy is significantly associated with uh, oral uh, DEA therapy. DEA in the presence of an active tumor or after complete ablation resection resulted in, uh, in an, uh, uh, DEA in the presence of an inactive tumor or complete resulted in excellent SVR rates similar to those without HCC. Uh, the viral control by the nucleoside analogs after radical treatment is info uh, very important for inhibiting HCC recurrence in the hepatitis B virus related HCC. Uh, nucleoside analogs has been shown to be associated with reduced risk of HCC recurrence. In conclusion, the most important advance in oncology ever is the understanding that most cancers have uh, specific causes and some of these causes could be prevented. Surveillance for HCC occurrence or recurrence is required among patients with an SVR at risk for liver disease progression irrespective of the antiviral regimen used. Further studies are needed to determine clinical utility and the underlying mechanisms of action of directly acting and HCC chemo prevention studies. And at the end, is it preventable or not? Thank you very much. One minute. Two minutes. <laughs> after the end of the session. And now, may I welcome the second presenter. The second presenter in our timetable was supposed to have a lecture on the current management of cholestatic jaundice, but Dr. Morasai is not around due to various reasons. So we will jump to the third lecture with the title, Role of Interventional Radiology in HCC management. And this will be presented by Professor Sameh Abdelwahad. Abdel 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 yes, Sameh Abdelwahad. My name. Yes. Sameh Abdelwahad. Yes, once more. Sameh Abdelwahad. Sameh Abdelwahad. Excellent, Excellent talk. <laughs>
Until he prepared the uh, slide, my name is uh, Samah Abdulhab. I am uh, the professor and the head of intervention ideology at uh, Ain Shams University. I'm going to speak today about the whole techniques of uh, local regional management of HCC. Okay. Um, I'm trying. I will try in this lecture to summarize the uh, main, our main issue, because it's very, very big issue. I'm going to speak about all the techniques uh, for uh, intervention ideology use for uh, dealing with the case of HCC. Um, of course, I am uh, happy to be with you today um, and hope you uh, a valuable and productive uh, scientific day. Uh, please, please, I want to, to, to move the slides. The main problem or the main issue, how to move the slides. I, I use it, but it doesn't work. So. You must okay. come me. Yes, this is the main problem in each uh, lecture. Yes. Uh, in the only, it's to move the slides. Okay. I know to move from here to move from there, but it doesn't work. So in um, the different techniques I'm going to, take, uh, to talk about it are either the percutaneous techniques or the techniques that are uh, done in the uh, CAF lab or in the uh, angio uh, Of course, yes. from, the, from the start, from the start, yes, we are now in the middle of the lecture. I want it from the start, before. The opposite. The opposite. The opposite. The opposite. No. No. The other way. From me. Yes. Yes. I stand beside me. Okay. Yes. Mom, come here. Okay. Only half of my part. Thank you so much. So, Egypt is considered nowadays as one of the hot spots in the international map of hepatitis viral carcinoma. Hepatitis C, of course, in Egypt, we have hepatitis C virus infection, which is the major risk factor in development of HCC. In about 65% of patients, it is a multicentric disease, while in about 35% of patients, it affects both loops. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay now. It's okay. Yes. That one. You don't want this. 
Yes, I don't want to because it covers the titles and covers the pictures. It was good. Yes, Dr. Muhammad, I don't want to see it. لا 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 بتاع الكودينج ما تنفعش اصل عليها صور هتيجي صور الحاجه بتاعتي انا عندي صور اشعه فهتخبيها هو السطر هات السلايد نفسها مش لازم انا مش عارف اقول له حد يجي يقول له مش عارف اقول له عشان انت ما عندكش صور يا دكتور محمد. بس. بس اوكي ناو؟ طب اعمل ايه يا دكتور؟ ده هي مشكلتي. <تصفيق> انا جيت هو المحاضره جاهزه هو واقف وكل حاجه عامله طب قول لي حضرتك بس. ما انا مش عارف اجي انا صفر. Yes, the main issue and the main problem that uh, when he put the upper title, uh, it will cover the uh, photos in my lecture. So I must leave it like that so I can show you the photos. And the titles of the slide have many slides here. So he's trying to. The most important uh, issue in treatment of HSC is how to screen the case of HSC. Screening of HSC offers the best hope for early detection, eligibility for treatment, and improvement of survival. Screening of HSC should be performed for all, for all high-risk groups every four months with both abdominal ultrasound, aiming for early detection, and it's very important to uh, early detect lesions or HSC uh, lesions because this uh, is very important to uh, the way in, of management. And the alpha fetoprotein aiming for early detection of rising teeth or serum alpha fetoprotein more than 200. Uh, how to diagnose a case of HSC? High risk patient with hepatic focal lesion and either uh, serum alpha fetoprotein is less than 200 or triphasic sparacet scan showing tip is sorry alpha fetoprotein is more than 200 and alpha and triphasic sparacet scan showing typical criteria for HSC. This is an HCC. No need for biopsy. Highest patient with hepatic focal lesion less than one centimeter and alpha fetoprotein is less than 200. Then follow up every two months by abdominal ultrasound and alpha fetoprotein is recommended if the lesion increases in size and then reassess with triphasic sparacet scan. This is for lesions which is less than one centimeter and alpha fetoprotein less than 200. Highest patient with hepatic focal lesion more than one centimeter, alpha fetoprotein has a normal level or it is less than 200. As you see uh, in Egypt, you can see the, 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 the limit of alpha fetoprotein is 200 for us. 
and triphasic spiral CT scan shows atypical criteria, it is not conclusive, then we go to dynamic uh, contrasted uh, MRI with uh, diffusion, and here we must use closed magnet, closed MRI, not open, and the magnet should be not less than one and a half Tesla. Uh, if MRI, in, in some centers, MRI is not available, so we can use targeted biopsy or ultrasound or CT scan guided biopsy. Highest patient with alpha fetopathy more than 200 and has no focal lesion, and this is, might be a problem. Alpha fetoprotein is rising with no focal hepatic lesion. What to do? Uh, and nothing can be detected by abdominal ultrasound, no triphasic CT scan, so we go to dynamic MRI. And in some cases, we can do PET CT scan. Treatment of a local regional management. I'm going to speak about my issue in local regional management, of course. Uh, an HSC which is less than three and a half centimeters away. You must be, uh, you must uh, take care about this point away from the bile ducts or intestinal loop without vascular invasion and no extrahepatic spread in child A or B patients. Again, child A or B patient, not child C. Uh, neither candidate for surgery nor uh, ready for liver transplantation. You see, surgery or liver, the patient is not candidate for surgery or liver transplantation. If it is this lesion is away from the great vessels, we can do radiofrequency or microwave. But if it is close to a great vessel, we go to a microwave, not radiofrequency, because the, of the heat sink effect of the radiofrequency. Uh, radiofrequency and the microwave ablations are contraindicated in lesions located in close contact with bile ducts or intestinal loops because they make injury or gang gangrene for these structures. HCC close to main bile duct or intestinal with absolute alcohol. If it is more than two centimeters, we go for taste or tear. From three and a half centimeters to five centimeters, we can do microwave. If it is from five to six centimeters, this multifocal only and give mix above and more than three centimeters tail. Large infiltrative HCC without vascular invasion in child A and B uh, or B patients we go for tail. The local region management of HCC as I said before is divided into three main subjects either percutaneous ablation, trans arterial embolization and the combined therapy. Percutaneous ablation, by, 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 by percutaneous ablation, I mean the radio frequency ablation, the microwave ablation, and local ethanol injection. I start by the radio frequency briefly. I'm going to speak about each subject very briefly. Uh, it can be done either percutaneously guided after sound or CT scan, it can be done laparoscopically, or it might be done intraoperatively. These are the types of needles that, that are present in the market in Egypt. Uh, a case of an HCC, here you can see that lesion. It is uh, in the arterial phase of CT scan. Uh, it is uh, vascular, uh, subcapsular, as you see, located at segment 4 of the quadrate lobe. Uh, this is before the treatment by uh, radiotherapy at uh, radio frequency, and this is after the insertion of the radio frequency needle. Uh, which, and now there is complete necrosis and this of the tissue. Uh, of course, when you have uh, an active tumor, it is hypervascular like that. Dead tumor, it is black like that, and it is dead necrosis of the tumor, complete necrosis. Another case of an HCC, 
here it is present at the right hepatic loop, just adjacent to the gold bladder. Uh, and you see here, uh, this is before local radiofrequency ablation. This is after radiofrequency ablation is complete necrosis and death of the whole uh, tumor. I, I intended to put these two uh, examples for treatment of uh, lesions by radiofrequency to say that it is not forbidden it is not forbidden to do subcapsular lesion, but not exophytic lesions. Subcapsular lesions and lesions adjacent to the gallbladder. But it must be done by an expert and well-trained interventional radiologist, not by anybody. Uh, of course, the radio frequency depends upon that this needle is connected uh, to a device on the outside. The device will produce alternating electric current inside the needle and it will result in cauterization or uh, ablation of the tumor like cautery, something like cautery. Microwave ablation in this technique, we use, uh, this is the needle, and in this case, this needle is connected also to a device, but that device depends upon the electromagnetic waves. That electromagnetic waves will result in heat agitation and it will result in burning of the tumor. Uh, what are the advantages of microwave over uh, radio frequency, it can it can ablate large tumors. It is faster ablation time. Uh, uh, that is with the radio frequency. Uh, here the microwave, uh, no heat sink effect, so we can treat the lesions that are adjacent to the blood vessels. Uh, as you see here, tumor in the right hepatic loop. There, so we decided to do microwave with good ablation of the tumor. Percutaneous and radio frequency, percutaneous radio frequency and microwave ablation of liver tumors are safe, can be done as an outpatient setting to result in tumor necrosis, good survival rate, survival, uh, sparing liver function, repeatable, can be done pre and post operative. Complications, of course, any technique has its complications. It might result infection and abscess formation in this, uh, the, the, the ablated zone, sloughing, burn, uh, venous thrombosis. But I said, uh, when you are an expert in doing the technique, you are going to minimize these complications. Percutaneous ethanol injection. Uh, Percutaneous ethanol injection is the first, I think it was Professor Schrecker, it was the first technique that was being done for the tumors, but now it has very, 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 very limited value after the uh, uh, presence of uh, the radio frequency and the microwave. So it's very limited. Indication, small lesions, think uh, Professor Shaker, one or two centimeter maximum, that are adjacent to main biliary or intestinal loops because of fear of using the radio frequency or microwave in these lesions, we can do uh, percutaneous ethanol injection. Uh, the problem that we must have absolute alcohol, which is 100% concentration on, or 99% concentration, and uh, use special needle uh, that has multiple uh, holes. And of course, uh, for treating a lesion by two centimeter, we need to do up to eight sessions of alcohol injection. Um, this is uh, ultrasound picture, and this is the tumor, the needle inside the tumor, and this is the picture after injection of the ethanol uh, inside the tumor with homogeneous spread of the ethanol within the lesion. Trans, the second uh, item, of that lecture is the transarterial embolization. Either we do traditional chemoembolization, or we do embolization by drug eluting beads, or we do what's called radioembolization. Shortly, transarterial chemoembolization. In this technique, we combine the uh, radiotherapeutic agent, which is mainly the doxorubicin. We get the powder and dilute it not liquid, it is powder, and we dilute it by saline, and we uh, get the lipidol. We 
mix the uh, doxorubicin and the lipidol, mix it multiple and check them multiple of times to so we can get the homogeneous mixture like that. We inject the uh, chemotherapeutic agent, chemolipidol therapy, very super selectively inside the lesion, and we can after that we can get the gel foam, uh, cut it in uh, small pieces. Uh, and diluted with uh, non-ionic contrast and injected inside the artery in order to uh, cut off the blood and block the arterial blood supply of the lesion. Of course, nowadays in the market there is special particles like the ambospheres and other particles that are more effect effective than the gel foam but more expensive. Uh, focal HCC seen here at the posterior segment of the right hepatic loop. Uh, this is picture uh, with injection of dye after injection of the chemolipidol mixture with concentration of the chemolipidol mixture inside the tumor, uh, and then after embolization of the tumor using gel foam. This, of course, are uh, angiographic uh, pictures. A CT scan showing the tumor, another gestapo of the tumor in the quadrate loop, uh, vascular tumor HCC that was treated and by chemolipidol and uh, occlusion of the arteries. And this is the picture after one month with dense concentration of chemolipidol within the tumor. Uh, another case, and this is after uh, treatment by this and you notice the, after one month there is shrinkage of the lesion with depth of concentration of chemolipidol mixture. Um, of course, by using uh, the lipidol with the concentration of lipidol with the, uh, chemo, with the chemotherapy, it might lead to some harm for the patient because it is a uh, very powerful mixture. So nowadays we can use uh, chemo, we can do the chemobilization using the drug eluting beads in order to minimize the effect of the chemotherapy on that cirrhotic liver and on the patient. Uh, the use of drug loaded carriers have been increasing the local concentration of the chemotherapy within the tumor, hence reducing systemic side effects with better response. Uh, as you see here, this is the embolizing beads and this is the cytotoxic drug. We aspirate the cytotoxic drug and then the cytotoxic drug is injected and mixed it with the embolizing beads like this and leave it for about half an hour or uh, 45 minutes in order that the beads will be loaded by the cytotoxic drug and then we take that uh, beaded, uh, the, the, the loaded beads by syringe and injected within the art. As regarding the selective prevention, screening for the vital component of treatment by drug eluting beads, you notice uh, complete necrosis of the tumor, and after three months, more and more shrinkage of the tumor with complete this uh, no viable tissue. Trans arterial radiomeration, this is the most recent and most uh, expensive method now which is used uh, for treatment of HC patients. Uh, of course, be, before the, 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 the presence of uh, radium mobilization, we, many, many patients come by the infiltrative, infiltrative HCC and the invasion of the portal vein come to us as interventional radiology and before the development of that technique, we tell them you have, we have nothing to help you in your case, to do for you in your case. But now it is mainly used in the infiltrative HCC with invasion of the portal vein. We can do TAF, trans arterial but uh, it's very, very expensive. So uh, this is its main problem. Radioembolization is the combination of radiation therapy and the procedure called the embolization to treat cancer of the liver. Pre-embolization, it is done in two steps uh, or two sessions. The first session, we inject technetium 99M macroaggregated album and do uh, an imaging for the patient for two reasons. 
uh, the first reason is that every one of us have what's called the hepatopulmonary shunt. But uh, uh, this uh, shunt is small shunt. It delivers about only 4 or 5 percent, sometimes 1 percent. In some patients and some people, the shunt is a high shunt. So if we inject the radioembolization directly in the first session, we might uh, introduce the radioembolizing material. It might be shifted from the liver to the lung. So it will, might result in radiation pneumonitis, and it is lethal, it's fatal. So we must give the patient at first the technician 99M in order to see the hepatopulmonary shunt, in order to see the concentration of the radioembolizing material inside the tumor, and in order to calculate the exact dose. So we done the, 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 the radioembolization in two sessions. Um, about one week or ten days between the session and the other because this radio uh, particle, radio particles it comes from uh, Germany, I think, so we must deliver it uh, on demand, not it is present in the stores. Uh, then after that, we after the first session and we are or we are sure that the patient uh, is okay, no hepatopulmonary shunt, significant hepatopulmonary shunt, we can uh, inject the atrium 90, which are injected inside the hepatic artery, which is feeding the tumor in order to block the arterial supply of the tumor. And once these microspheres become loaded at the tumor, they deliver high dose of radiation. Uh, as you see here, a large infiltrative mass lesion seen at the right posterior segment of the right hepatic lobe invading the right portal vein after uh, two months from the uh, injection of the radioembolization nearly there is no lesion it's like that and it is necrotic and you can see now it, it, there is no progression of the thrombus inside the portal vein this is the mean of the confluence of the portal vein and left portal vein. Successful. Another case, large infiltrative HCC seen at posterior segment of the right hepatic lobe with invasion of the posterior segment of the right portal vein. After one month, the shrinkage of the tumor and slight activity. After three months, nearly more and more necrosis of the tumor in comparing the list like that. And after six months, nearly shrinkage of the posterior segment of the right hepatic loop with compensatory hypertrophy of the left loop. Benefits of radioembolization um, for patients in operable uh, tumors, radioembolization can improve the quality of life. In some cases, it, may, it might allow for more curative options such as liver transplantation. Radioembolization reduces fewer side effects compared to standard radiation therapy and compared to this, a higher dose of radiation to be given during radioembolization than with standard external beam therapy. The last issue, and it's very small, the combined techniques. Uh, what I mean by the combined techniques, the combined techniques, we combine two of the previous techniques at the same session for the patient. For example, taste followed by radiofrequency. In this te te technique, taste is performed first followed by radiofrequency after four weeks. You see here, this is a uh, tumor, large tumor seen at the anterior segment of the right hepatic lobe. Uh, after this, you see uh, condensation of uh, chemolipidol mixture in this part of the tumor, but this part of the tumor is still variable, so we decided to enter uh, our needle here to uh, do a radio frequency for this still viable part of the tumor. Uh, in some cases, we do radio frequency first, and then we do this. This procedure, radio frequency and this, are done, done at the same session for the patient, but we apply the radio frequency needle first, uh, as in this case. We have done here a large lesion seen at the upper segment, anterior segment, segment 8 of the liver. We see here we applied the radiofrequency followed by this, complete necrosis of the tumor, 
and uh, concentration of human control picture as a part of the church. Another case with the combined technique, uh, chemo uh, therapy, uh, chemo taste with radio frequency. You see complete necrosis with concentration of hemoglobin at that part of the tumor. Although combined techniques show better outcome regarding the survival rate and efficacy, but there is still limitation due to insufficient studies and insufficient stripe uh, standard life protocols. Thank you so much, so much. I'm sorry for that long uh, talk. I'm very sorry. Thank you so much, Professor Samuel Abdelwahad. Abdelwahad. Professor Samuel Abdelwahad. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. So, a round of applause to Professor Samuel Abdelwahad. So. May I humbly welcome the next presenter who will be presenting to us HCC MNH with National Hospital Experience, Dr. Eric. Then it's option. You got three more. Yeah. One day I get. Yeah. One day. No, no, no. I'm not going to zoom. I'm not going to. That's why I'm not going to. Ah, I'm going to see. I'm going to see. Ah, I'm going to see. reminder to each one of you, those who are not yet registered, please get registered at the table behind the hall, at the corner, for logistic issues of the conference. Oh,
Nomba hiyo ingia kwenye internet ingia kwenye Gmail yangu tu first. Ah, nataka kutumia. Mhm. tunaamishia umu anatuma kwa email be ah ndio nataka tufanye hivi
who is like the same thing we are doing here, and we did like initial assessment. At that time, I was doing my residence, and then in 2019, when I was done with my residence, the program of conservation of knowledge was officially open. So I have to join another two years to do my intervention of the audit. We were three at that time, two Tanzanian and one Bolandese, who is back at Rwanda. So you can see since 2017, and now we, we have graduated to almost seven, and this year we have like three. We have expectations this year more than 124. So with those full of the procedures, you can see that in 20, in 2018, quarter one, we had less than 50%, 50 procedures. You can see the graph now. Up to the first quarter of 2022, we've done uh, almost around 1,654 procedures. That is totality. But the graph below, you can see the green line. This is number of missing attendees. Sorry. Uh, the green line, this is the number of visiting attendees. As years goes on, the procedure numbers are increased. However, the numbers of attending are going down. This means that we are being trained in our local areas. We don't depend, and we, we, we are sure that after two, three years, we will be no visiting attendees, except on those complex cases. But the number of procedures are going up because we have locally trained people and are doing these procedures. So this is our facilities at the MNH. <coughs> Sorry. We we don't have a catalog, the dedicated catalog so far. We are using MOI. This is a MOI catalog. But good news is that before but I'm saying we the office, we have procured our own catalog. It's here now. Uh, almost we have like one month now, landed in Tanzania, and our room, there's a construction going on. So we expected maybe before the end of this year, our new baby be in town. Uh, oh, we are using CT to do the core new office, which is also part of the HC management. Uh, we are using, we have a small, like we can call it like, like a minor theater at the uh, biology department, and then we use ultrasound. So ultrasound, there are some procedures, we have fish them in the ultrasound, some boxes which are very difficult, we send them to CTs, and all material works, and there will be complex like tests and stuff, we are doing them at more, this is a more facility. And uh, this is our number so far. Uh, we have done vast, nine vascular tests, almost like 1,000, and a vascular like 300, which is almost like two. And uh, among the nine vasculars, the core needle, but we have done like 500 core needle boxes. Lima only is 100. You can see, okay? If you go to virtual cases, we have done a, some couple of UFEs. And you live in Rapture and the staff of that which you have taken care of. So you can see, like, the number is quite uh, high. So, I don't want to give you cases because I've removed most of my cases because good cases have been projected here. I cannot override my boss. But the most important is uh, we are running clinic here at the MNH daily, Monday to Friday, 8 p.m. to 5 p.m. Doors are open for discussion. But we have formed uh, the with the help of uh, the leader from the Castle Guy College, who formed that it must be disciplinary, we have a group, and we have, formed, uh, we, have, we have formed with a team, GI Stadium of uh, Medical, and HC 
state-specific uh, channel, which is was supposed to be, I uh, think, next week. Yeah? So, please, all cases should be discussed that are an emergency decision. Uh, like, this, this slide that we left it because we've been receiving a lot of calling of houses. But if you review them, it's like, if you see the interfaces, HCC is like at five, okay? The other people are thousands. And they were like, oh, why call? Initially, it was very difficult to abuse the colleagues. We need some to forward. This is internationally agreed protocol. So that's why the, uh, like the number of calling robots now are necessary. Calling robots are going down. Okay, because of these like, discussions, tumor and stuff like that. So we did this because the trapezic, the trapezic was HCC, but the other four protein was only three. Okay, so we were in the dilemma. Then we, that's why we decided to go and do like a call. The call confirmed this is HCC. This, this is the kind of call you would about to do. We cannot do with the HCC suggested, uh, CT suggested HCC. Other people protein is suggest clinical down, clinically suggest what you see. I think we have a lot to do uh, concerning that. And uh, this is one of the cases we got. Uh, I just left this among the six cases I had. This is said nine years old, came to us with a tumor of almost 11.5 centimeters. We agreed to use the Barcelona as the tumor was true. And then, as I read, this is like a palliative test. It's not like curative, it's a palliative test. You can see a tumor there. I don't know if it can play. Just a hell of a So, you can see how much. The good thing is, was almost with a lot of background, but confirmed on the internet study. So we did the test. Also. I decided to leave this faint image because we did this under CM at that time. Uh, I've removed all the fancy images because this is where we started. Before having those fancy fancy stuff, you cannot see it there. But we use it.
Apart from that, we don't have those most of our equipment, and the vast equipment are not even in this center. So most of the companies that are trading to do like this, because in a lot of uh, bureaucracies to the different this 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 equipment. Uh, lack of awareness. Uh, I'm sure even some of us in the meeting we didn't know before the implementation that the samples we have been done at the moment. Uh, but this is one of the awareness that I get. I don't get on the services because the MNH now is going to the super specialized center. Uh, uh, we are also suffering the same like other departments. This super specialized stuff like uh, services are not in the NHF or other insurances. We needed to work together. Uh, this super specialized staff to be the research, uh, and then to be people to get insurance. Because it's a little bit expensive on a single shot. Like HCC, our patients come in a late stage. But this has been fair. Like, because most of my teachers are from North America, they are so surprised. That we have patients in a young age, okay? But, and then most of them have like HFSB, which is quite different from that uh, setting up. Why are we treating them the same way they are doing in yours? Okay? Even the presentation is not the same. Are we treating them because this is a CC? How sure are we that they and the magic and the, the molecular level of the process to be Karanga uh, from the Boma, Sisusunasis from where coming from Mwanza, okay? Causes the same kind of disease. So we have a high amount of crime. Let's do our own research on our own patients so that we can at least present what we have and treat our patients according to our local findings, okay? Calling upon this, they call upon industries to support higher services. And uh, because, like, cardiologists that are doing endovascular, information are doing endovascular, some of the GI, can like, we start thinking of like doing like a back supply, back purchase of equipment? Because at the same companies, the companies producing catheters for IR. It's the same companies, some of them produce it for cardiology, for, okay? So if we purchase in a bank purchase, we can have the purchasing power, and we can start thinking of negotiation with these big companies, okay? But the problem of Africa, we would like to work separately, close door, let's open door, let's start building the, the, the needs. Funding of Ireland and Tanzania is still a challenge. We are educating our services in the hospital in the country. And uh, legislation of Ireland, formation of labor legislation. Labor cancer legislation. That's, this is the way to go. Okay? And then, uh, on job training, attachments, collaborations. This is, this is the heart of the world. Goes. If you go to international meetings, people are doing great work. Just because they are working together. Conclusion, MNH provides those kind of IR and management. Multidisciplinary approach is a way to go. Okay? So that Sajoni can have good outcome, GI medical can have good outcome, IR can have good time outcomes, because the aim is to see our patients have good clinical outcomes. Okay? Uh, intervention therapy plays the integral role throughout the various diseases of state of CC. These therapies are uh, generally well tolerated and also minimum invasive and a relatively low risk therapeutic option for palliation and cure. We are now looking at our eyes on ablation. I think I was talking to uh, my boss there, they can offer us like a ablation machine, and then that's the way we are thinking to go. So if I conclude, Please, you can take a minute to see the video. This is a short video we made from our department. We made this way the first biggest class where uh, 
they give me a final exam, okay, and they show some few areas from my department and are working. Please don't get bored. That's why I didn't enter it here. Different universities, and 
These are some of the recent trade graduated fellows. This is from Nigeria. And the next year we are receiving two people from Nigeria. Sadly, one from Tanzania is too tough. Those are the seniors. So this place we can find them at our clinic. So be free to share with them some information. And this is the catalog, the, our new machine. I went to visit you as uh, specific offices. So this box is, is where our new baby is waiting to be open. And uh, this is Professor uh, Fabian from here. And this is Madame Dennis from the Emo University in Atlanta. Thank you for listening. Well, we see you again.
in order to, after this ending of these two days, one of the recommendations that we found that in order to tackle the problem of HCC, it is a must to be on a national base in order that all of us sit together what are our plans and let's go through it. And what is important here in the intervention, I want to ask the doctor, for example, I don't need to start to treat HCC with taste and radio frequency. Because if I have 100 patients, and Mohibili can act with three patients. I lost 97 patients. But if there is, for example, percutaneous is an old injection, and it is a very primitive, and it is a very old, and you now there is new things, it's okay. But by a sonar and a radiologist that can take a true cut biopsy, he can do this. So the 97 patients that I cannot give for them radio frequency, I cannot give the observatories because my budget is low. I can give them service that in Cairo in Egypt, any patient, any patient can find, has HSC, can find around him in 20 kilometer or 30 kilometer a doctor that can do for him IR. By this way, they have, every university has now its own uh, group, its own, as, doctor, as it started with Dr. Mohammed Kamal Shakri and Shams University, that now any patient around Egypt, 20 kilometers, he can find everything. This took years. But I think that it must be one of you as the job of the Tanzanian, that after what we listen today, after the three presenters, it is a multidisciplinary approach that need to be uh, said. Uh, one question for the professor, is the uh, percutaneous is an oral injection something give good results or not? Something difficult or not? No, it's not. Well, to perform an oral injection, you should have restrictions. First of all, it is absolute alcohol. It's okay. No, it's not okay to work because you should have the ampoules of the absolute alcohol which contains 10 cc, not the jar that contains yes. one liter. Because once you open the jar, it's not absolute, it's not absolute anymore. Comparing the one I think the, the inventor of this vaccine, he has received the Nobel Prize, Sarah Metcalf, he received Nobel Prize for, for this because he, he did it. Not a single injection. Yes, you said that. It is multiple injections. Okay. So to follow up, each patient to see if this viral tissue still or not, you need contrast enhanced ultrasound. You cannot do triphasic spiral CT each week. You need contrast enhanced ultrasound. The machine is very expensive. What do you do before the contrast enhanced? How do you need follow up to help the patient? This was not the you are talking about perfectionism. No, I talking not about perfectionism. I talk about adapt and win. I you are not win because because you you are not going to, to know where is and you need you need a special needle for the uh, injection. It's not uh, a single uh, or a spinal needle because the septations inside the this this what we learned from what happened. Okay, one more thing, but it's a uh, good you can't control the injected amount of absolute alcohol. Because we tried this very early, 20 years ago. It may be reduced to a, a wide range of the level causing more damage and more causes. It will spell out and spread out, out and cause uh, besides it causes severe pain to the patient. So we prohibited it. Very, I, I published a paper very early on alcohol injection, but I don't like it. Same. Thank you, Professor Sherman, but uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, alcohol uh, is now becoming to be some sort of historic after the era of radio frequency. Uh, we need to do multiple sessions for the patient. Eight sessions for region, one and a half or two centimeters. It's very, very painful that the 
condition that Dr. Sabela said is very the problem of absolute alcohol. Another issue to get absolute alcohol, as Professor Shaker said, we as radiologists, you couldn't uh, do it uh, in a proper manner because of pain. Pain. It's very painful for the patient, even after you finish the patient, even if you do it by general anesthesia. Very painful. And the patient refuses to come for the second session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My yes. very this is our experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So after radio frequency, it is the radio frequency, the error of radio frequency, uh, no, it became his So this has come us back to and the early, early detection and prevention. Uh, so uh, 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 just one question for the for the our uh, colleagues. How many of you, when they see a patient with HPV, try to know if he's cirrhotic or not? Because cirrhosis is an independent factor for HCC. How many of you ask for non-invasive or do the non-invasive calculation to know if his patient is has fibrosis or not? Fit four or something like this. Because this is something very important. Once you have an HPV patient come to your clinic, any hepatic patient come to our clinic, the first thing to put on his card or on his file, what is the stage of this patient? Because if he reach FIP4, and you know that FIP4 is just ALT, ASCT, H, and platelets. And all of us ask for this, and it is an equation on the mobile. Because once I found, and this equation is very good for F0, F1, and for F4. But F2, F3, something debate about it. So it is very important in our daily practice that once we have any liver patient, it is a must that we write on his file. Because if he is F4, it is very important to enter him in the screening program for FCC. And it is very important to enter him in the screening program for osophageal viruses because now we have the beta blockers and we have the ventilation. So it is an obligation of us as clinicians in our department that once we have a patient with liver disease, we have to localize him for fibrosis. Again, that, as you said, the prevention. Any question for, for the presenters from you, please? Very clear. <laughs> yes. Mission accomplished. No. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, I have a question to Professor Mohammed and another question to Professor Samir Abdel uh, The first to Professor Samir Abdel uh, is uh, I'm just requesting you to give a comment on the uh, issue of alcohol as a cause of uh, 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 liver cirrhosis and finally hepatocellular uh, uh, carcinoma. And one of the preventive measures is to stop taking alcohol. And alcohol being used to treat hepatocellular carcinoma in a uh, 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 Transatlantic injection. If you comment about it. Number two, number two, uh, question, Professor uh, uh, Muhammad. Uh, in one of the findings, I think it's somewhere it was shown that uh, eating vegetables was more preventive in the, uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma as compared to those who eat fruits. Did you find out what was the uh, uh, reason behind? Well, let me answer this question because uh, this was a study done as uh, to have healthy food. So they said that eating vegetables as a healthy food is much healthier and much less causing to the HCC. This was a study, this was not a study. So I don't have a reason. 
<laughs> and for me also, uh, of course, uh, alcohol is, is one of the risk factors for one of the main problems that will result in HTC. But alcohol will come by the reality and will be absorbed by the blood and the end, end. And this goes to be the result in HTC. But here we treat the HTC. The HSP by alcohol locally. It will not go the normal circulation, it will go just for the region and the region. Okay. Do you have a seven hour problem? Oh and and what? please uh, sorry, sorry. and as I said now nowadays uh, it became a story. Alcohol it became alcohol it became a story. It's not so effective after the development of it. Even the alcohol the patient for HC with alcohol, it's now going to be absolute. In very, 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 very selected cases, small lesions that are adjacent to the test of mobile blood. And nobody in Egypt now is doing alcohol injection. All of us are doing either uh, RF or microwave or doing taste work. Professor Reda would like to comment. Using uh, alcohol as a drink, this is a different thing from using alcohol as a treatment. Because in case of alcohol injection, you are using absolute alcohol. That is 100% concentration. In a very localized focal region for a very short period of time. So to start, you are targeting a, 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 a region the very localized region with a very powerful uh, concentration, 100% to treat. Uh, talking about drinking for fun is another thing. Or for 8% beer alcohol or wine 20% uh, or 10% uh, uh, or 15% or whiskey 20% or even vodka 30%. This is another issue. Okay? Thank you. Uh, I should first thank very much all the presenters. I have uh, two questions to... As regarding selective intervention, screening for the vital component... After intervention with all the radiological interventions that we have discussed, you mentioned the issue... Not everywhere can get pushed sound. Can we rely on half of the protein at some point? And the second question is what is because I'm, I'm an old man, so. <laughs> <laughs> the the protein is not for follow up, it's for surveillance plus ultrasound. And all, as I said in my lecture, all the Guidelines, yeah. the SLD, the Apazo, the Chinese, Japanese, all Southeast Asia do surveillance with ultrasound plus alpha fetoprotein. In addition, nowadays there is a scoring system, the GAT, the GALAD, the GALADS. It's a new uh, scoring system. Uh, invented by Roche Company. The GAD stands for gender, age, alpha fetoprotein, and the disc gamma carboxyl from Galadus. They add for this the alpha fetoprotein L3. Gal uh, the GAD. The Galadus, they add to the GALAD the ultrasound. This is a scoring system. So the alpha fetoprotein plus the ultrasound is good for surveillance. But after you do intervention, you follow up the patient by, as I said in my lecture also, by CT, CT or MRR, the first year every three months, second year if nothing appears, so you can extend the duration. So the second question. Thank you. That is a little bit expensive to follow up every three months. I think in our setup it would be a problem. Yeah, but at least 
if you have done an intervention, something has been done. Now the second question is, uh, it's about the investment for interventional radiology. We know now percutaneous ethanol injection seems to be obsolete, and everyone of you does not like it anymore. Now, how, how, how does it cost at least to invest for maybe microwave or having radio frequency? At least in our national hospital, think about it. Well, it's expensive, but the life of a patient is more expensive. So from the Zoom, Professor, from the Zoom there are questions. And uh, Dr. Regasha referred to ask the question. Dr. Regasha? Hello, Dr. Regasha? Yes, Dr. Regasha. Uh, we are still working on technical issues. Uh, I can hear you, maybe I can paraphrase for the team. If you can hear them, please repeat the question. Yes.
You have to go to the land MRI, go to the website. This is the first issue. After this and after uh, radio You must do trifism. Uh, it is better to do dynamic MRI or trifism. If there is no dynamic if, uh, both of if them. both techniques are present, you can do for the after radio frequency, you can do either CT scan or dynamic MRI. But after this, yes. you must do dynamic MRI. Because uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, chemolipidol mixture will mask any activity within the lesion after this by CT scan. But dynamic MRI will, uh, show, will show us whether there is still viable tissue. So, very important to minimize the, 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 the biosis. And of course, another point I would like to say to my colleague if you have by trifasis by CT scan, uh, criteria of HCC, and you see in your case, as in your case, the alpha fetoprotein is normal, depend upon the trifasic spice scan. Because in about 30% of cases, patient has an HCC and normal alpha fetoprotein, as our professors, Professor Toshek said. So it's very important that you must give the radiological investigations its uh, priority, the priority. If it is not conclusive, go to the court. Sir, this was, I want to add something. The, <clears throat> we have to move to the second yes, session. The imaging the technique, it should be on top, the criteria of the HCC on top of liver cirrhosis. You must not, have a liver cirrhosis patient to, to, to apply uh, this criteria. Yes. Okay. No, because in, in the event of hepatitis B, you can have a tumor without liver cirrhosis. So all the, the international guidelines, these imaging techniques apply on a cirrhotic liver. I think we have to move to the second session because we are too late. And thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, uh, Professor <coughs> Mohammed, Professor Mohammed, and Dr. Wangura for carrying his leading us through the discussion of the first part. So, because of the technical issue, the people from Zoom, Dr. Regashen, and the other people from Zoom who wish to ask questions. So, at the second discussion, we also give chance for the question. As you can hear us, our discussion, we can write the questions on the chat. And we can answer the questions and they hear us. Not necessarily to hear them. Ask them to write the questions and please collect the questions to be answered in the next discussion uh, of the upcoming session. Thank you. Uh, our fellow colleagues following up through Zoom, we are humbly asking you to type the question on the screen as we are still working on the audio techniques. And uh, we'll be jotting them down and they will be answered accordingly in the coming session. Thank you very much. So, without any further delay, may, I, may we start the second part of the session for today? And uh, now we are hosting the part of hepatitis. We have two lectures. The first lecture will be from Dr. Tadis uh, on update of viral hepatitis. And the second lecture about on updates on uh, now uh, now FE that is from Dr. Mwana Sai. Non avoid liver disease from Dr. Mwana Sai. Thank you so much. So may I welcome Dr. Tadis to share with us updates on viral hepatitis.
Good afternoon, police. I can see there's a lot of sites, and, uh, and we're wholly immersive into it during the morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to you today on uh, viral hepatitis, and particularly hepatitis B. I was in Tanzania about uh, 12, 13 years ago by working for the University of Washington Global Health Program, primarily on HIV and TB. It was impressive to see the skyline of Dar es Salaam flying over yesterday from Addis Ababa. Uh, I think you're making probably a remarkable progress in, uh, in the economy. Thank you. So, yes. Oh. Before Dr. Tadi starts, uh, may we welcome the panelists for this session. And uh, we'll have Professor Reda, I uh, will have Dr. Majige, and Dr. Sangeti. Please welcome and take the front seat. Welcome, Dr. Thank you very much. I thought I was all set. Colleagues, uh, um, colleagues, as you would all know, um, maybe the, the organizers. Uh, That thing on the screen might uh, might hide some of the texts. Uh, is there any way to remove it? Um, while that is happening, um, the global burden of uh, chronic hepatitis B infection, as you all know, is much much bigger than HIV burden. Uh, looking at around 40 million people to be living with HIV infection. Until now, an incurable infectious disease. But we're looking at around 300 million people living with uh, hepatitis B infection. So it is uh, more than seven times the burden of HIV. But the global noise and support and funding has been more to HIV. And in fact, the response to HIV pandemic has killed, virtually killed the response to other infectious diseases, or at least to minimize the focus, for example, TB diseases. There have not been many new molecules discovered in the last 30, 35 years, except a couple. So this is another silent killer that has not received much focus. And every year, we expect about 1.5 million incident cases around the world, and uh, more than uh, three quarters of a million cases every year due to the sequels of chronic hepatitis B infections, including hepatocellular carcinoma. The treatment of chronic hepatitis B infection, or chronic hepatitis, has been static for a long time. We do not have uh, hepatitis B treat all, as we have hepatitis C treat all, for all adults and adolescents, as we have hepatitis C treat, HIV treat all, for, for everyone living with HIV. The natural cause of chronic hepatitis B has been either a chronic hepatitis infection or a chronic hepatitis itself. In the past, we used to classify them as immune tolerant, immune active, carrier state, and the like. But lately, it has been divided into hepatitis B E antigen positive or E antigen negative, chronic infection or chronic hepatitis. This helps a little to define the treatment. But one question that I would like to leave to everyone here is, is there no benefit to treat everyone with established chronic hepatitis B infection, especially if we have said treatment? Number two, immune tolerant phases, or what we call now chronic hepatitis B with E antigen positive state, where there is chronic hepatitis B infection with very high ALT, but there is no clinical sign of clinical sign of uh, very high viral load, E antigen positive, ALT is normal, there is no other clinical sign of liver, liver damage. Shouldn't we take that? It's a matter of time when this viral turnover will lead to chronic hepatitis or liver inflammation and, and, and hepatocellular carcinoma. The goal of chronic hepatitis in this case, not hepatitis, in fact, hepatitis B infection, but chronic hepatitis with clinical sign and lab indications of inflammation of the liver is number one to improve the survival of the patient and to improve the quality of life of the individual. 
but also to prevent an onward transmission, whether it is vertical or it's horizontal transmission of hepatitis B virus. Very highly, very highly infectious virus, much more than HIV infectivity. The recommendations have been that there are some key endpoints. Number one is to have a longer term induction um, of suppression of hepatitis B DNA. Also, it is important to achieve that E antigen loss is 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 real because it is a surrogate marker of viral high viral turnover. LT normalization because it's a clinical indication that there is no more hepatocytes being slaughtered due to the, the inflammation or the infection. And an optimal an optional endpoint could be hepatitis B surface antigen loss. Whether it is a structural cure or a functional cure, time will tell. But some patients were treated with directly acting antivirals, including nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors like CAP and TDF are achieving surface antigen losses. There have been different criteria. We were using the practice guidelines from the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease or the European Association of Liver Studies, Studies of Liver Disease. Often, Three factors are looked at, as you know, hepatitis B DNA, hepatitis B DNA level, serum ALT level, and clinical severity of liver disease. All patients who have E antigen positive status or negative status that have chronic hepatitis, or in the past we used to call it chronic active hepatitis B infection, would be eligible for treatment. But patients who have cirrhosis, clear cirrhosis, but have any detectable level of hepatitis B DNA would be eligible for treatment. All patients who are not cirrhotic uh, with um, hepatitis B viral DNA level of more than 20,000 international units per annum and ALT more than two times upper limit of normal would be eligible for treatment. And other conditional or optional recommendations for treatment as well. But what has been available for the treatment of chronic hepatitis or chronic hepatitis, active hepatitis B infection on the landscape. And you remember the parenteral treatment with uh, interferon alpha, with all the toxicities, or the, the pegylated version of interferon alpha. Later on, oral nucleosides, nucleotide analogs came into the picture, including lamivudin. We have seen it in the early 2000, 2004, 2005, where we have some patients with breakthrough hepatitis, hepatitis flare, because of resistance. Alepovir. And take up here, tell me you did. And then lately we had tenofovir disoproxy fumarate, and then of late we have now tenofovir alafermide fumarate. Our talk will be more on the nucleoside analogs, the latest nucleoside analogs, tenofovir disoproxy and tenofovir alafermide fumarate. Those are products of a novel drug called tenofovir that we widely use for HIV treatment. In 2017, the ASLD recommended the use of either integral viral one or tenofovir disoproxil alone or tenofovir alafenamide alone as a standard treatment for the treatment of chronic immune active hepatitis B. The European Association for the Study of Liver Disease recommended the same. But what were the limitations of these this recommendations or some of the, the prior, the precursor medications? As you know, if you treat Hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, chronic active hepatitis B was lamuvid. There's a 20 to 25 percent chance of developing full resistance against lamuvid in one year per patient. Literally in four to five years, you will wipe out, and all onward, likely onward transmissions of hepatitis B could then be resistant. Then in take of here, an older molecule relative to the other nooks, when you give it on a background of a failed treatment to lamivudin, your patients in about five years, will, if you use it as a rescue therapy, about half of your patients will develop resistance to your integrity. So should we go back to our patient interferon, alpha therapy? No. The good thing is that TDF, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, which, which forms actually a backbone of HIV treatment at the moment, has demonstrated impeccable efficacy and virtually no resistance developed by the, by the virus against, against TDF. 
Earlier, earlier during 2000s, 2003-2004, for patients failing to lamivudin, we used to add on TDF as a rescue therapy. But by that time, we didn't have enough evidence to say that TDF alone can actually rescue the patient, rescue, rescue the battle. Until today, there is not any information public that the virus can actually be clever around this medicine that the virus can develop resistance against telephone, which is a very good, a very good information to have. In the future, we'll not, we wouldn't know, but until now, TDF is fully effective against, against the trisitric virus. However, the problem is, it's not an angel. It causes massive bone turnover, leading to bone mineral density loss. Imagine your patients who are near andropos and menopause with frail bone, predisposed to frailty fracture. So bone mineral density loss has been a main problem and we have been looking at it over the years. And more patients are getting old. The other problem is TDF causing proximal tubular dysfunction of the kidneys. Initially tubulopathy that can progress backwards to actually vocal glomeruli and then glomerulonephritis and chronic kidney disease can happen. So because of this, there has been a growing concern about whether we should give TDF to patients with chronic active hepatitis or should we revert back to integrity. Do we have an answer to this? Do we have a better option to this? Maybe let's look at, let's look at TAF, tenophobia alafanomide fumarate. Both tenophobia alafanomide fumarate and TDF are programs. TDF is a disoproxyl fumarate where tenophobia is attached to and TAF is alafenamide fumarate. What would happen is, why don't we give tenofovir alone as an active drug? Problem is, if you give it, it is very poorly bioavailable and it cannot cross the gut blood barrier. So it's of no use and will not administer tenofovir parenterally. So it is packaged, packaged in the form of a product so it can easily shuttle through the gut wall and be available in the blood. But the problem is this, when you give TDF at 300 milligram dose of tenofovir itself in a form of TDF, what happens is almost all of it will readily cross into the blood vascular compartment. And from that, a very small proportion of it will cross into the intracellular space where it is needed. The battle is in the cytoplasm of the cells where the hepatocytes are, and the TDF that we have we have administered has to get into tenophobia. Once it goes into the hepatocytes, it will be converted into tenophobia diphosphate, which is the molecule that takes on the body. But it is only 10%, around 10% of what is administered or is in the plasma will be required in the cells. The remaining 90% is freely wandering in the plasma and getting into all tissues virtually. So this gets into the proximal convoluted tubules causing tubulopathy, gets to the bones causing both mineral density loss. So it is all a proportion game. At 300 milligram, you will have much unwanted dose of tenofovir that actually affects the bones and the kidney. In terms of TAP, highly efficient vehicle that takes tenofovir across from the gut wall into the plasma and also have an efficient penetration into the hepatocytes to convert into tenofovir diphosphate, you'll have a 25 milligram dose exposure. And if you look at the concentration that is freely available in the plasma, off target will be very low, <coughs> leading to relatively more safety in kidneys and the bones. There were two landmark studies that were conducted, which will be looking at among hepatitis B infected patients, chronically infected with hepatitis, and who required treatment. Study 108 and study 110. And they actually were the reasons for some of the guidelines to be shifted into inclusion of TAF. So study 108 was a study that was done among hepatitis B E antigen negative individuals and 110 was done among patients who are hepatitis B E antigen positive state and the difference is clear, right? Because there's a very high viral turnover when E antigen is positive but in some cases there could be pre-core mutation that actually could be elusive and E antigen is positive, but you may test it to be negative. But in general, what they did was, among the E-antigen-negative chronic hepatitis patients, they randomized them into two. 
One arm received TAF 25 milligrams without any booster. And then the other arm received TDF 300 milligrams. They were followed over several weeks, several months. And then based on the response and the safety profile, the data safety monitoring board decided to actually extend it into an open level extension and move all patients who are receiving TDF over to TAF. So we'll see this, the findings together. Study 110, same design, randomized double blood active control phase 3 trial, but the only difference was these patients were having hepatitis B in antigen positive state. And the primary endpoints included viral suppression to levels, levels below the level of quantitation of 29 international units per ml. And secondary endpoints are 96 weeks included, still undetectable viral load, and also AFT normalization of the patients and some serology to look at E antigen status and surface antigen status. So the, the findings were very instructive. In patients who were E antigen negative at 48 weeks, there were compound suppression between both arms. TAF and TDF achieved more than 90% suppression. Are we together? Yes. There's some discussions in the house? No. Okay. Just, just confirming the duration of the talk. 40 minutes, I guess. 40 minutes. Yes. Just. That's what I was before. Okay. Is there any change? You have the, you have the ruling part, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to be on time. But interestingly, at, at week 96, almost similar proportion of patients actually maintain suppression, which shows you the durability of treatment. The durability of efficacy, however, again, you know, it's such chronic treatment, adherence is an issue, but there was no difference. Among patients who participated in study 110, where E antigen was positive, very interesting, the suppression was much lower. It was sub 70%. Patients who received uh, TDF 67% and TAF 64% suppression, and this was not of clean, the difference of 3% suppression rate between the two was not of clinical relevance. But over time, at 96 weeks, actually this suppression rate increased to over 70%, close to 80%. So that is an indication that we might have to treat it as people a longer period. Even if there is no one clear guideline that says treat for so long and stop it for so long. There's, there are so many factors that may decide, may help you decide to stop for some time. But the interesting part is here. If you look at ALT normalization at 96 weeks as a surrogate marker for clinical health of the liver, among patients who were E antigen negative by central laboratory criteria, patients who received TAF had an 89% resolution to normal ALT level. Among those who had de deranged liver function initially. But among patients who received TGF, it was 71%. There was a 10% point difference in effect size and then that was statistically significant. Among E antigen positive patients in study 110, 75% of patients on TAF normalized ALT as compared to 68% of patients on TDF. And then it was also of clinical significance, uh, 0.017 p value. By ACLD criteria, which is more stringent in terms of cut off, 50 versus 40% and 52 versus 42%. On average, about a 10% point difference. So, LT normalization was superior among patients who received TAF. Other than that, I hope you're able to see this faint, faint um, curves here. Patients, uh, the study uh, investigators were also able to look at the bone mineral density over time using Dex DEXA scanning. What you see here as a blue curve is patients who received TDF. And then the other dark curve just below the zero line, or the x-axis, is patients who received TAF. You can see that the bone mineral density over time continued to go down in, in the hip bone among patients who received TDF. But you don't see so much turnover, bone mineral turnover in patients who received TDF. That was similar on the spine bone. Patients received TAF had minimal reduction in the bone mineral density overall, and patients who received TDF actually continued to lose their bone mineral density. If you translate into clinical 
challenge. It could be more osteoporotic or osteopenic. This is the the creatinine inclinance estimated by the Cockroft Gulf equation, which is not a very sensitive equation, a specific equation, for, especially for people of African lineage. You tend to be slimmer, you have lesser weight, and Cockroft Gulf depends on weight. So it's not a very, very accurate estimating equation. But what you could see, the difference in both arms was very significant. Patients tend to lose more and more efficiency of excretion when they received tibia, but Less, less loss of glomerular filtration rate when patients received TAF. We don't expect TDF to cause glomerular damage early on. We expect it to cause tubular dysfunction early on. So the moment you catch the patient with chronic kidney disease, with glomerular obliteration, what is likely to happen is the patient might have gone into advanced kidney disease. He might have missed the bus. So that is the problem. So the bigger problem is safety. TDF is a great drug, highly effective. We have seen it at a population level. We study, we see it in, in, in clinical trials. We don't expect that there will be resistance mutations to emerge while on treatment. But what we don't like with TDF is the renal and bone safety profile. So now the DSCB has decided to move all patients in study 108 and 110, 110 to an upper level extension to TAF after nine, six weeks of treatment. Then it is very interesting to see how those renal markers and bone markers change over about 48 weeks from 98 weeks. What was interesting was during the upper level extension, looking at the LT normalization, among patients who switched from T4 after another 24 weeks of weight or from open level extension of 48 weeks from 98, 96 weeks to week 144. This was a curve we initially saw. Patients who received TDF, going, the, the GFR going down, patients who received TAF. What happened after moving them to, to TAF? As you can see, the broken curve, the dotted line here, from week 96, was a progressive increase in efficiency of excretion. That continued to go within a sloppy manner and closing over to the difference at week 144. And if you look at it, the acceleration of reversal from week 96 to 144, the difference was statistically significant within one group. And the difference in glomerular filtration rate between those on TDF and those, uh, those on TAF and then those shifted to TAF was actually insignificant. That clearly illustrates the reversal in the glomerular efficiency in, in, in excretion. You would also see on the bone mineral density loss. Patients, this was the pattern that we saw and it progressively goes back. Again, on, on, the, on, the, on the spine bone, it was the same. Besides these two, two, two landmark studies, another problem is dosing. How do you dose patients with TDF if the GFR is less than 50. You start by giving them once every other day, then you will end up in giving them once every week. If the, if the GFR is less than 10, and if the patient is on hemodialysis, you may give one a week, once a week, and then the, the patient continues the hemodialysis. But the renal dosing for TAF, if it's, if it's, even if it is not universally agreed upon, you can dose it fully until 15 ml per minute. So you will not have a dosing issue there. Adherence will not be an issue. The patient can program its memory to take it every day. But if the patient has a creatine clearance of less than 10 and is doing hemodialysis on the day of the hemodialysis, after dialysis, the patient can take a dose of 25 milligram. So these studies came up. In 2020, SLD and ESCA both revised the guidelines, but they reaffirmed the inclusion of TAF for the longer term administration. Both TAF and TDF have stronger resistance, barrier to resistance, again as, hep again as hepta hep hepatocy I mean, uh, hepatitis B virus. So they are recommended for a longer term use with a strong recommendation. Preferred regimen, TAF monotherapy, TDF monotherapy, or intecavir. But we saw that in intecavir, about 50% of the patients will lose, uh, the medicine will lose 50% of its by actually, in 50% of the population by five years. So now, 
if you want to position taf as an effective therapy, whom do you give it for? Is the question. But in their recommendation, they have put it in older patients, more than 60 years, patients with bone disease, and patients with some renal derangement. Um, SLD have put more or less similar recommendation. Now, the point is, how do you change your treatment practice in Tanzania or elsewhere? If you have Intecavir, if you have TDF, if you have TAF, which molecule would you give and to which patients? I think with that question, let me, let me stop here and hand over to, to the moderators, to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, the discussion to the end. Uh, now I'm, uh, I have to call on the, the next speaker, Dr. Masawa and his website is going to give an update on nothing. Dr. Masawa. Uh, we are still probably around the same area uh, of our knowledge 
uh, since then. So I think the discussion might continue further. Uh, this is just an acknowledgement. So, so we are going to touch on our definitions, uh, the background, and uh, assessment, and screening, and management. So, so what is NFLD? Uh, that means uh, sensible uh, past and future accumulation uh, in the presence of uh, insulin resistance. Although in some cases, the patients are without uh, insulin resistance. Uh, against the doses, uh, more than 5% of the parasites. And uh, also, you have to be sure, while you're considering NFLD, that you have to exclude other causes uh, of fatty liver such as alcohol and uh, other issues. So uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver is just pure steatosis uh, with uh, at least uh, mild lobular inflammation. And then it progresses to NASH if there is some fibrosis and uh, inflammation. So uh, we all know that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can progress, uh, or at least it is a risk factor for HCC. So NASH has been uh, categorized into early NASH, uh, uh, the, the intermediate stage, and the uh, F4 fibrosis. Uh, so I think we'll uh, discuss this further. But as uh, it is highlighted here, uh, to make a diagnosis of NASH, you need a, a liver biopsy. So although there are non-invasive uh, markers of liver fibrosis, which can be used uh, as an alternative, but to be sure that this is actually NASH, you may probably need to do uh, a biopsy. So, so NASH is a, is a broad spectrum uh, from simple steatosis to HCC. Uh, so you, you can see, as I was uh, uh, speaking before, you have to rule out the other causes of uh, uh, possibly fatty liver. So uh, alcohol, drug-induced liver disease, uh, HCV, I mean, uh, hepatitis C, uh, and the other ones like hemochromatosis, autoimmune hepatitis, celiac disease, Wilson's disease, uh, alpha, uh, alpha fetal, uh, what is this, beta proteinemia, uh, hypopituitarism. So you have to uh, patients on uh, parental nutrition and the, the inborn error of metabolism. So you have to work up uh, your differentials quite well to be, to be sure. So again, this is just to highlight that uh, in uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, this is a, <coughs> it's a global disease that is affecting not just uh, the liver, but it's a metabolic problem uh, involving many organs. So this is uh, to highlight how uh, the pathogenesis. Uh, so there are many factors involved, but at the end, it is the uh, activation of the uh, of the fibroblast system, uh, and, and I think the hallmark again that we have to remember about uh, insulin resistance. Uh, so, so again, this is the same uh, outline. Uh, I will touch a bit again on the on the on the prevalence, the, pre the epidemiology. Worldwide, it is estimated that uh, NFLD uh, is affecting, uh, depending on different uh, studies, from 17% to 46% of adults. And in Africa, uh, the literature is showing us there's a range between 8.7% in a, a, an epidemiological study, I think this was in Nigeria, to up to 47%. So depending on where you are, you are studying. And it has also been found even in children. So again, we should be uh, broad to think of fatty liver as a problem in all of our patients. So again, uh, screening in the community, probably value is, is limited due to several factors, including uh, cost. Uh, the ultrasound is probably the easiest way to, to, to screen and it may be employed, but if you involve other laboratory tests, then uh, the cost is high. Again, there could be low predictive value of the non-invasive test, and the risk associated with liver biopsy. Again, it will be difficult to do uh, biopsies in, in the community. Even in the hospitals, still we avoid biopsies in most cases. 
uh, and it may not be probably feasible or available in some places. And again, the lack of uh, uh, effective treatments. So, so again, we, we have to remember that the diagnosis of NASH provides, again, uh, important uh, prognostic information. If you can say well, this is early, this is intermediate, uh, or this is advanced fibrosis. So uh, we know uh, the risk factors, uh, high calorie intake, excess fat, uh, high fructose intake, and sedentary behavior, which leads to obesity and the NFLD. Uh, so, so this should be taken as a metabolic syndrome overall. So it is usually also good to consider other factors. So there are also some genetic uh, risk factors, that, such as the PNPLA3 and the TM6S4 genetic carriers. So in these such patients, uh, you, may, you may find a fatty liver with NASH and without uh, insulin resistance. So you have to be careful in some of the patients who are actually lean and presenting with, uh, with fatty liver. So we probably don't have studies in Africa, but this is something we need to look up into the future. And it might be good to do genetic testing in some cases where you have a lean patient uh, with fat liver. Uh, again, this, this is showing you a similar picture uh, uh, of genetic factors, of poor nutrition, uh, and eventually uh, you have uh, uh, lipotoxicity, uh, then inflammation, cirrhosis, and HCC. So how many patients will progress to NASH and cirrhosis? So it seems a simple steatosis is a low risk for progression. Only about 8% of your patients will progress over 8 to 13 years, while those with the early NASH, 13% uh, may progress to cirrhosis and 5 to 10% will develop, will develop advanced uh, fibrosis and probably go to, to cirrhosis. So patients with the simple steatosis may require long-term follow-up, but they are probably at low risk of, 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 of cirrhosis. So as I said before, liver biopsy is essential for the diagnosis of NASH uh, because the clinical, uh, the biochemical, and the imaging measures do not clearly distinguish NASH from steatosis. Uh, so again, this also is highlighting the, the definitions that uh, NFL encompasses steatosis plus a lobular uh, or portal inflammation or ballooning, while NASH requires the presence of steatosis, lobular or portal inflammation, and ballooning. So this information cannot be obtained uh, uh, without uh, the biopsy. Although the non-invasive markers of uh, like the FIB4 that the professor was talking about, if you see uh, this is a high FIB4, that means there is a higher risk of, of advanced fibrosis. So it can also uh, give you some information about fibrosis. Uh, so non-invasive markers, uh, they identify the risk of NFLD among individuals with increased metabolic risk in the primary care. So still, uh, since uh, it is difficult to do uh, liver biopsy in all of your patients, in the primary care uh, and even in the specialist centers, still you'd want to do the non-invasive markers like the FIB4 to, so that you can stratify your patients who are at risk of advanced fibrosis. And then if you are finding they are either intermediate or advanced fibrosis, then you can make an informed decision whether you would wish to progress and do liver biopsy or not. So it will identify, as I said, those with worse prognosis. And it will also help to monitor disease progressions and predict the response to your therapeutic interventions. So I think this is a, is a repetition, but just a reminder that type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovascular events are higher risk in patients with the NFLD, and we know about 40% uh, of mortality that is happening in patients with the fatty liver is related to cardiovascular uh, mortality. So fibrosis, again, as we said, the non-invasive markers of fibrosis, 
fibrosis is the most important prognostic factor, and it correlates well with the liver outcomes and mortality. So this is an algorithm uh, to show how you should uh, stratify your patients. Uh, on, the, on the left side, you see patients who are obese, uh, type 2 diabetes with a metabolic syndrome, and uh, so, so they have the risk factors. Then you are looking into the imaging evidence of fat accumulation, which in most cases will be probably a simple ultrasound. Uh, and then you are doing your basic LT and GGT abnormalities. Again, you see from the pool, you have to exclude those with the other secondary causes of steatosis and those with significant alcohol consumption. So if you consider this is NFLD, then you have to rule out uh, advanced fibrosis. So this is where uh, the, the non-invasive markers come into play. Uh, so we see uh, the NFS, uh, the non-alcoholic fatty liver fibrosis score, and the FIB4, uh, which are more important. So if your score for the FIB4 is uh, less than 1.3, that means this is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, is low, uh, is F1 probably. But if it is uh, between 1.3 and uh, uh, 2.3 in the middle, that means this is probably uh, intermediate. And higher scores, greater than 3.25 uh, for FIB4, they indicate uh, advanced fibrosis. So in such patients, you may consider uh, to do uh, liver virus. So, there, so how will you, will you go? So if they are in the low risk category, uh, which will be about 56 to uh, about 58 percent, they are very risky. You may consider uh, repeating some of your scores at least after uh, two years. And if they are intermediate, uh, which will be about 30 percent, then uh, by scoring, probably you have those who are F3 and F3, F3 and F4. Uh, again, uh, you have to, in such patients, because they are in the intermediate, then depending on the other markers that you have, you have to decide whether you are actually giving treatment or you are just following up. But those who have advanced fibrosis, they probably definitely need treatment. And you may consider to do a liver biopsy. So I think I don't want to repeat this. So again, this one uh, highlights that the importance of uh, uh, insulin resistance uh, and the fatty liver disease. Uh, and again, to consider other uh, markers of metabolic syndrome, uh, include the impaired glucose tolerance or type 2 diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, low HDL uh, or increased waist circumference, and high blood pressure. So patients should be screened for the other metabolic markers as well. Uh, so this is uh, about insulin resistance. Uh, again, you may consider to do it. Uh, so again, uh, these are uh, highlighting about the same obesity, uh, type two diabetes. Uh, so, so, so the diagnosis uh, protocol, as we say, it should come from the patients that you are thinking they are probably at risk. Uh, so your history will include uh, alcohol intake, uh, your personal and family history, your BMI, your waist circumference. Uh, uh, risk for hepatitis B and C, history of steatosis, uh, associated drugs. Uh, again, you are wake up for the liver enzymes, your fasting blood glucose. So I think this is a repetition that we might all well know. And again, you want to exclude the uh, other uh, illnesses. So the diagnostic flowchart, uh, you see uh, at the top, the metabolic risk factors. Again, you want to do an ultrasound. If there is a steatosis, uh, and there is no more uh, liver enzymes, you do serum biomarkers uh, mark so, so, so that you can have the non-invasive uh, markers. If, if they are low, maybe probably F1 or no fibrosis, then you, you may fall up after, after two years. If there are no more liver enzymes, uh, then probably you have to refer your patient to, to the specialist. Uh, so if there is no steatosis, no uh, normal liver enzymes, maybe you fall up after.
three years if you see that these patients are actually at risk because they have metabolic risk factors. So in general, NFLD is a pro slowly progressive disease, both in adults and children, and the, the rate of progression uh, from, uh, from fibrosis score uh, is corresponding to fibrosis stage after every uh, 14 years for NFL and every seven years for those with the NASH. So, so the rate of progression is doubled uh, in those with the arterial hypertension, and it, it may be rapid uh, in some cases uh, with fibrosis. Again, just to remind ourselves that it's still uh, this can be a pediatric problem. Uh, I don't want to repeat this. Uh, I'll be jumping some of the slides. So regarding treatment, uh, dietary and lifestyle changes uh, suggest uh, uh, they have shown some benefit. Uh, since diet and, uh, and lifestyle changes uh, have been, uh, if you lose weight, you reduce it reduces liver fat, it improves your hepatic uh, insulin resistance, and it can also regress NASH. So weight loss is advised around minimum of 7% for those with the simple steatosis, and once this is NASH, you should adv advise your patient to lose at least 10% of their body weight. So again, uh, dietary restrictions may be individualized, but generally the Mediterranean diet uh, is uh, advised. And uh, exercise, aerobics, and resistance training. So regarding the energy restriction, generally you should limit your calories to about uh, 500 per day. Uh, as I said, 7 to 10% uh, weight loss target. And again, you have to maintain in the long term. Limit your fructose. Again, coffee is good uh, for the liver. Also, you have to limit your intake of alcohol, improve on physical activity, and uh, improve on your micronutrient composition. So it should be low fat, low to moderate fat, moderate to high carbohydrates, and uh, low carbohydrate uh, ketogenic diets, or high protein. So again, uh, regarding pharmacotherapy, again, there is no one single treatment that is uh, uh, proved to be uh, uh, FDA approved for, for treatment, but there are several treatments that